We are in the seventh chapter of Kohelet. We have been discussing a number of different things. And last week we got into a very interesting verse where he discusses, Kinsana discusses an idea of uh, not looking at the past and saying, wow, what about the good old days? You know, and saying that, uh, you know, why is it that those days were so much better than these days? So it's not a, that's not a, it's not out of wisdom that a person says such a thing. Uh, and I actually, I, I gave a potential reason why, it, how it relates to the surrounding verses, but after more thought, I think that um, looking back at it, once we see this week's verses, we're going to see that actually it was more an intro to these verses, as opposed to an ending of the last verses. Uh, so we'll, I'll, I'll, you, hopefully we'll see that as, I, as we go through this week's verses. Um, that was verse 10. Okay, and so this week we're going to start with verse 11 and continue from there. So without any further ado, let me get into our screen share so we can see this all together. Okay. All right, I have the, I have the uh, letters nice and big this time. Hopefully it's, it's easily visible. All right, and that is what we're up to right here, verse number 11. <clears throat> and it's a pretty short verse, but actually if you look at it, it's kind of hard to 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 <clears throat> sorry. It's a little hard to understand or to identify what he's trying to say. Uh, and I'll explain it in just a second. Let's first translate it literally. Okay, the first thing we see is Tova Chachma im Nachala. Good is wisdom with an inheritance. Okay, a nachala is an inheritance or a uh, what's the other word that I'm looking for? A uh, Okay, whatever, an inheritance, it's a, the birth, a birthright of some sort. Okay, so better is wisdom that comes along with inheritance. Uh, Vioter, and more so, the roe hashamesh, to those who see the sun. Okay, let me read that again. It's kind of, again, I'm, I, in full honesty, this is a strange verse so far. Tova chachmaim nachla, good is wisdom with an inheritance. Vioter, and more so, to those who see the sun, okay? Yoter, uh, we have that quite often. Yeter, that yud, taf, resh, that is, indicates more, more so, okay? Um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty common shoresh, pretty common word, uh, root word. Um, and we actually have seen it a lot in the book of Kohala, and it's actually going to show up in the next verse also. So again, this verse seems to state that it is good to have wisdom with a birthright, and more so for those that see the sun, which again, we're obviously faced with a clear question, what connection to those who see the sun, and what does it even mean with this idea that good is wisdom with an inheritance? And so I found it fascinating that immediately right off the bat, a lot of the commentaries disagree in what these words mean, and what even the first half of the verse means. And not only that, it's, it doesn't even just go back to the commentaries, it goes all the way back to the sages in the uh, midrash, they seem to have different understandings of what this, how what this phrase means. Let me just give you the the basic understanding first, which is that wisdom is great. It's wonderful if a person has wisdom, but wisdom only gets you so far, so to speak. Right? You're, if you're if you have wisdom, that doesn't necessarily ensure that you're going to have all the means that you need to get by in life. So wisdom is great. It's even better if you have money. <laughs> if you've got wisdom and cash, then you're in a great spot, okay? Uh, I would like, to, I, I wanted to kind of point out over here that it doesn't just say tova chachma im kasa, right? Good, that wisdom is good with money. He actually says in nachala with inheritance. So I would kind of perceive, perceive in this that wisdom is even better, not just if you have access to money, but wisdom is even better if you have money that you don't even have to work for, right? An inheritance, you don't have to work for, it comes to you. Uh, obviously, there's no such thing as a free lunch, but in, to a certain degree, there, there's something to that, right? If a person doesn't have to work for it, then we're talking about that's a real ivory tower situation. Guy's got wisdom, person's got wisdom, and also all the means, they don't really have to work that much. So he says that's, that's a pretty good thing. Um, I don't, does he mean good is in, it's good for the world, 
it's good for a person's self, or it's just we perceive it as good. He doesn't necessarily say. Uh, it would it would seem that he's indicating that this is in and of itself a good thing, meaning it's a objectively good thing uh, to have wisdom with money, not just money, but money that you don't have to put a lot of work into. Okay, uh, interesting lesson, <laughs> uh, and and a little hard to walk away with, or to even walk away with for us to learn something from. And also, it's very also very difficult to line it up with the end of the verse, and more so for those who see the sun. Okay, we still have to contend with that end of the verse. Another way that this that the uh, commentaries look at this is that tova chachma im nachala. If a person has an inheritance, it's good to have wisdom with them. Okay, meaning that in this case, it's like saying it's good to have salt with your steak. You know, not to say that. The salt's the main thing. In fact, the steak is the main thing, but the salt improves the steak. So in that sense, the, what the verse is saying over here is wisdom improves your nachala. So let's say a person, that, that would create a better, kind of a more, uh, a more consumable lesson. If the person has for it, then better is to approach it with wisdom. Okay, so uh, for example, we have we've seen very often it's a, a a common thing that we see ruins their lives. Right? They don't have they don't treat it with wisdom, and because of that, they uh, they lose a lot of their uh, they, their lives are worse off because of this money. Right? So that does happen occasionally. So that would that. In that sense, what this verse is saying is that it is good to treat your money with wisdom, to know how to use it properly, to know where to place it. What is the connection then to the Oter a Hashemesh? That it's better, even more so, for those who see the sun. What is the connection there? Uh, um, but it's better off. You're better. You're better off. I'm sorry. When a person has money, and particularly money that they didn't work for, they're better off if they have also a nice, a nice serving of chachma of wisdom. Okay. Okay. Again, a little more consumable lesson. There's another way to look look at this verse, and this is actually one of the ways that the sages look at it themselves. Is that wisdom is better? Tova chachma. Wisdom is better when it's treated as an inheritance, okay? Im, meaning in this case, even though the word im means with, but in this case, it means with, with, the, with recognizing it as an inheritance, okay? So in that sense, is actually, that, that already also has two potential meanings. Either that you treat it as, you know, I didn't work for my wisdom, or I've put in a little work, or, you know, let me put it differently. Wisdom is inherent. It's an inheritance, right? It's not something that then you necessarily have to put work into to grow, or you may just be born with it. And so when you treat it like that, you realize it's not something that makes you better than other people necessarily. It does, it does put you on a in a better life position, but it's something that you it's a responsibility more than a, a gift, I would say. Right. So when you treat wisdom with that look outlook you treat it as a responsibility and then you have a job to go and share it with people and to work with other people uh to use your gifts to improve the world around you so that would be another way of looking at it. that's one of the ways that the again that the sages look at it another way in the same vein is to say that wisdom is good when you treat it like an inheritance in the fact that you give it to other people, okay? If you have wisdom, you want to, sh again, share it. It's a same, similar idea, but it's just what's the object and subject of the sentence. Again, you're looking at it in two different ways. So again, over here, one of the ways is looking at it is like, for example, Moses received the Torah. He received divine inspiration from God on the mountain of Sinai and, and gave it over as a gift to the Jewish people. So that's one of the cases that they say, here, you look, here's wisdom. That's treated as an inheritance. It's shared with other people. It's shared it like a gift. Uh, they say also, uh, look at Joshua, who received the Torah from Moses, 
and then went ahead and gave us the land of Israel, which Moses was unable to do. So Joshua then goes and creates something physical out of that wisdom, conquers the land, gives it over to the, to the children of Israel. All right. So that is another way of looking at this verse. All these ways of looking at this verse are still stuck with the same question, is what is the end of the verse doing over here? Vioter and more so, leroy hashamish, to those who see the sun, okay? Still a very difficult thing to understand. Rashi, the king of the commentators, I, you know, we kind of look at him as the king of the commentators, Rashi. He says over here that, what, what does it mean, and more so for those who see the sun? He says, those who see the sun is a term that we use for humanity, right? It includes all humans. Everybody gets to see the sun, right? And he brings a couple uh, Talmudic proofs to that, uh, to that idea. And so what he's saying is that wisdom is good with an inheritance, for an inheritance, as an inheritance, whatever, however you want to look at it. And it's not just for you, but for everybody. Everybody in the world benefits from wisdom, okay? That is a way of understanding that end of the verse. Uh, it's a little difficult to, to explain, to see it that way, um, because why would he say, and more so, right? If it's, and wisdom is good, and more so for everybody. You know, like, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny way of stating the verse. Uh, the Mitsuda, who's also one of the key commentators over here, we've quoted him very often, uh, he says a very interesting idea that Roe Hashamesh are people who look to the skies for their answers, people, the astrologers of old, who used to go and look at the, at the stars and, and try to divine the future from, those, from, from the stars. So those people, unfortunately, he says, are falling into a trap of foolishness. So if you get to have access to wisdom, that can help correct your mistake of trying to divine the future from the stars. Uh, again, an interesting take, and not necessarily clearly stated in the verse, but it's it's a, it's an idea. Okay, a a a, a very good, uh, a very interesting way of taking the verse. Mm -hmm. And the, in the same way that we have this question of what to do with the second half of the verse, you also have a question of what does this have to do with what we're talking about? What does this have to do with everything else surrounding this verse? Because we just said, as we said at the beginning of the class, we just said in the last verse that uh, you can't, don't want to look at the past and say times were better back then. You know, I, I wish I was living in the past. That's not a statement of wisdom, we said. So what does this verse then have to do with that, where he says, and wisdom is good as an inheritance? It doesn't, and, and, and even more so for those who see the sun. It seems to be a, a, an interesting shift in the verses and particularly because no matter how you dice this verse all the different ways that we've explained it how we've now explained it five or six different ways most of these have already been stated in one form or another earlier in the book right we've had a lot of these lessons already brought through come through said stated uh in earlier verses so it would be an interesting thing to, for him to then just restate it over here out of context and um, in this strange way, uh, which is why I'm kind of led to my own take on this verse. And it's, it's, I'm, I, it's admittedly a little off the beaten path, <laughs> but I do think it fits very well into the coming verses and actually will take us most of the way through the rest of the chapter which if you look, this is one of the longest chapters in the book, if it's not the longest, I think it may be the longest. And we're going to see that this theme is actually going to show up through the rest of the chapter. So uh, bear with me over here while I try to introduce kind of a new way of looking at this verse. That's, again, you're not going to find this in any of the other commentaries. It's kind of my own way. That's the one amazing thing about Torah is that there's, we, we, we say that there's 70 ways of looking at everything every question, every answer, every verse, there's 70 ways of looking at it. And 70 is just means to say this, you know, innumerable ways of looking at something. So I'm offering another, I'm going to offer another explanation over here. And that is that this word nachala, which usually does mean inheritance, I want to look at it as history. Because history is very much the same way. History is something that is 
comes down to you. You don't necessarily do anything, right? Just like an inheritance, you don't do anything. It comes from the past, from previous generations, and is handed to you as you, uh, to where, wherever you are. Uh, there is no Hebrew word for history. Uh, in fact, as I was researching this, uh, th this when, I, when I was thinking about this, I Googled it. Is there a Hebrew word for history? Because I know in modern Hebrew, they say historia, right? Just history, right? They just uh, uh, Hebraicize an English word, as they very often do. Um, and the closest that you'll find perhaps is zikaron, which is, means remembrance, right? Uh, but it's not actually history. So there doesn't seem to be a Hebrew word for history. So I want to offer that perhaps King Solomon's trying to bring out the idea of history over here while um, without, without there actually being a, a fitting Hebrew word for it. So in that sense, when we look at it like this, he says like this, Tova chachma im nachala. If you want to access the good wisdom, if you good, when you want to find wisdom, good wisdom comes with looking at things through the lens of history, through the context of history. And what that means, what that, what that, sorry, what that means to say is we live in a world that surrounds us and we see the world around us and we, we contend with the world around us. But we have to understand that the period of time that we're living in is really just a blink of an eye in the larger scheme of things. And so what we might find is that when we are dealing with the world so that surrounds us, people will tell us certain things are wisdom. They'll say that certain things are fact or science or this is just the way it is or things have just become truths. But in reality, if you want to, if you're seeking wisdom, you have to find, you have to look at the larger context of history. Now, not to say that everything that's historically considered a fact is now should also now be considered a fact. We know that, for example, that the, you know the the Earth goes around the sun, right? We've we've figured that part out clearly, even though most of history told us otherwise. We know that we know that it's not true. Okay, so that's not so. It doesn't mean to say that everything that's historically that's based in history is automatically true. But what it does say is that when you're looking, when you're seeking for truth, you do want to understand it in the larger context of history. Okay, and <clears throat> Uh, that what that does is that that creates a certain level of skepticism, healthy, I would say healthy skepticism on everything that's being presented in your day and your time as obvious truth. Okay. Uh, sometimes we look at progress and we are we are uh, drawn to say that it's that great, we've we've un, un, uh, we've found a new truth or sometimes we look at progress or 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 some sort of uh, change in the world and we're we're reluctant to immediately accept it as true so in that sense you're going to be guided through this process through 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 the lens of history <clears throat> this is particularly true for somebody who is aware of their surroundings, right? You could live, obviously a person could live in a cloistered environment and have no acts, no, no, nothing to do with the world that surrounds them necessarily. And when a person's in that situation, maybe they don't need to really look at things. They're not curious about anything. But if you are one of the Ro'e Hashamesh, you're one of the people who look towards the sun, I mean, you're, you're looking at the world around you, at the world that surrounds you, then you want to see it through the context of Nahala, which again is we're looking at as history. So if you are, again, if you are, uh, if you are one of the Ro'e Hashamish, you're a type of person who's is curious about the world around you. You look towards the sun. Okay, again, no one's got, got a great explanation of what looking towards the sun means. And I'm offering that the idea is that if you are a forward-thinking individual, if you're looking up, if you're looking up at the world around you. And you're curious about what is truth? Where will I find wisdom? So then you want to see it through the context of history. Okay? Uh, so that's what I think this verse is saying. And hopefully we'll see this lesson a little clearer come through in the next verse. Okay? But before I say, before we go into the next verse, I just want to point out that the last verse said, don't look at the past and say things were better then. And this verse says, when looking towards the future, also consider the past. 
So he's giving us kind of this balanced approach, which was which is an, an important piece of 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 chachma, of wisdom, is that you have to have a balanced approach. You can't only look at the past and say things were better then. We need to recreate some previous time in history. You also can't look at the future and say forget the past, brand new. There has to be some sort of balance between those two things. Welcome, Nachshu. Um, so those are. I think that's that's one of the reasons. This is how this verse now ties into the the verses surrounding it, is that it says we're talking about finding wisdom. We're talking about finding wisdom in the context of history. Look towards the past. Also, don't be don't be locked to the past, but also don't uh, uh, but also don't forget the past. Also, all right. So, and with that, we're going to move on to verse number twelve. And with, which will give us a very interesting uh, twist to, to this idea. Okay, and this is now verse number 12. And uh, you'll notice that there's a little bit of prose in it. Uh, and that's how actually a lot of the commentary, commentators look at it. But again, with our kind of newish interpretation, it actually comes out a little clearer. Uh, it's less, less, uh, less poetic, which, which works better. So let's see for a second what the verse actually says. Verse number 12 over here says like this. Because in the shadow of wisdom, is in the shadow of, of money. Literally, kasef is silver, okay? So within the shadow of wisdom is within the shadow of money. V'yitron da'at ha'chachma and greater is the knowledge of wisdom, techayev aleha, which gives life to its owners. Okay. Now, here we have a number of interesting things, but before that, let's just read the verse one more time straight through. Ki betzel ha-chachma, betzel Because in the shadow of wisdom is in the shadow of, of, of money, of silver. V'yitron da'at ha-chachma, techayev aleha. And the, the greatness, or what's better about the knowledge of wisdom, is that it gives life to its owners. Okay, so right off the bat, well, again, we have two disparate ideas that seem to be brought together in one verse with this qualifier of key, which means that it's tied back to the last verse. We've got the vav over here, a v'yitron, meaning that it's adding to what was just said, the, 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 uh, the prefix vav. Which means and, and then we've also got a number of a, a number of strange things over here. We've got this uh, strange sentence structure. It says, "In the shadow of wisdom is in the shadow of money," which is a very strange strange. Does he mean to say wisdom and money go together? Does he mean to say that money begets wisdom? Does he mean you know what is he meaning to say there? Uh, and we've also got. The fact that chachma is not just chachma in this verse, which it usually is, not just wisdom, but it's the knowledge of wisdom, da'at ha-chachma. And finally, the fact that it gives life to its owners, which, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? So, a lot of questions facing this verse. Uh, I'll tell you, first, first of all, what do the sages say on this verse? They say that uh, wisdom, you will find, if you know how to manage your money well, you will access wisdom. Okay? Uh, which again, going with those previous, those in those initial understandings of the previous verse, where inheritance was literal, uh, so it's trying to say that you know money and wisdom are are go very well together if you know how to use them. And what we're saying over here is somebody who knows how to use their money very well, meaning in the service of God, is what they're they're coming to, come at, to say. Somebody who knows how to use their wisdom well will also, sorry, somebody who, knows how to use, somebody who knows how to use their money well will also find wisdom. They say, for example, that if a person uh, gives money to, to, to scholars, to Torah sc scholars, then it gives them a little portion of their, of, of their Torah learning, of their, of their scholarship. So you get to walk away with a little bit more wisdom in your pocket. Now, is it actual wisdom that you're going to be able to use yourself? Not necessarily, but you have contributed to the greater goal of wisdom, I would say, okay? So in that case, what we're saying with the strange prose at the beginning of it is that 
in the shadow of wisdom, you will find the shadow of, of money, or perhaps the other way. In the shadow of money, you may find the shadow of wisdom, okay? Um, again, strange, uh, strange sentence structure, but that's, again, what the sages say. They're not wrong. Uh, that's definitely true. Uh, but I think that based on what, we're, what we've been saying, there's another way to look at this verse over here. And that is that now he's looking at Chachma. He, when he uses Chachma, or part of the reason why he differentiates, he has Chachma and Da'at HaChachma. These are two different things. There's wisdom and the knowledge of wisdom. As he's really talking first about, first of all, about what people consider to be wisdom, okay? Th that, those things that is accepted in your day, in your time period as being wisdom, okay? When, when we look around at, at the world around us, people assume that certain things are true. People assume that certain things are, are objective truths, when in fact, he wants to point out that they are really subjective truths. And that can be true with really any of the sciences. Definitely be true with, with certain scientific things. It can be true with history. And I probably, probably I would say history is the biggest, uh, the, the biggest one that where sub, subjective ideas become accepted as objective truths, okay? And when we see that, we have to ask ourselves, where do these... Uh, subjective ideas come from and more often than not they more often than not than not I'm sorry they come from the shadow of money okay and that means to say like this money is a powerful tool money is a a, a great thing when it's used properly as again as the sages point out in this very verse over here that when you use money in a good way it's 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 a wonderful thing however money also has the ability to shape what the world considers to be chachma, what the world considers to be wisdom, okay? Uh, I mean, say like this, when we look, we, we always say, it's a commonly said phrase that history is written by the victors, okay? I mean, the people who are in charge, people who have the power, who have, in this case, he's, he's saying that people who have the money, they get to decide what chachma looks like, what wisdom looks like, what history looks like, okay? And that's just the, that's just the reality. And so in this, when we look at it like that, we have to, again, looking at that back, that last verse, again, key that because at the beginning of the verse tells us to tie this in with the last verse. So in the last verse, he says, wisdom is better with a larger worldview, right? Don't just look at what people assume to be true. Don't just look at what people, what your time period has assumed, has assumed to be chokhmah, has assumed to be wisdom. Rather, you want to look at a larger worldview. And why do you want to do that? Because when you're looking at the shadow of wisdom, okay, you're actually looking at the shadow of cash, of money. You're looking at what somebody in power has decided is truth, has decided is wisdom, okay? This is the tzel ha This is the shadow of wisdom. This is not actual wisdom. When you look around the world around you, you may just be looking at what we would call the shadow of wisdom. It's not actual wisdom itself. It's just a subjective uh, idea that has been accepted as objective truth because of the power of this shadow of money. What's better than that? Better than that is da'at ha the knowledge of wisdom. And knowledge is an interesting idea. Da'at, we've had this many times, this is a very common shoresh, but a very common root word. But da'a means knowledge in the full sense. You know something is true. It's true knowledge. So dat ha would mean the knowledge of wisdom, meaning real truth. Real truth is something different than the shadow of, of wisdom. Real wisdom is different than the shadow of wisdom, sorry. Real wisdom has a very special ability. It's able to keep its owners alive. It's able to give you some a, a ability to survive beyond your... Uh, the little world that you that you inhabit. It gives life to its owners. First of all, the people who engage in truth, truth, they are owners. They're not just people who happen to have some wisdom. They own wisdom. That's because they're accessing real truth, eternal truths, I would say, eternal wisdom. And it gives them the ability to, again, 
live, meaning in this sense, to live beyond the world that the immediate world that surrounds them. So again, we're talking about a case over here where there's a world that we live in, and certain things are thought to be true. But if you look with a greater worldview, and you don't just get stuck in what's the fashion nowadays or what's the what what's what ideas have been accepted as objective truths, when you look at them and say, hold on a second, where does this objective, where does this truth come from? Is it objective or is it subjective? Is it coming from some sort of powerful, interested party, the shadow of, of money, that's creating this as a truth, that's creating this as some sort of wisdom? Better than that is to instead find true wisdom, find timeless wisdom, find the thing that's going to, no matter what, always be true. And that's going to make you live beyond that world that, that immediately surrounds you. It's going to give you the ability to live, I would, whatever, I would say to live eternally, so to speak. You know, we have this idea, an idea that the, uh, the, the old uh, Greek philosophers had, uh, which is not true, at, at least from a Torah perspective, but it's at least an idea that they had that there was some sort of idea that through accessing philosophical ideas, through tapping into philosophy, you're able to connect to some greater kind of, they didn't believe in a God necessarily, but it was some sort of world wisdom, high power thing, okay? Uh, I, uh, to be perfectly honest, I've never read, I've never read the philosophers themselves. I've seen how it's expressed in Torah literature that discusses what the philosophers say. But Aristotle and Plato and the like, they seem to have tied into this idea that you get to, by accessing philosophy, you kind of tie into this larger world, this deeper kind of spiritual plane, this metaphysical plane, I would say, um, uh, which can give you the ability to live beyond the physical world. It's metaphysical, right? Um, so again, that's not necessarily a Torah concept, but it's interesting. This We find a similar thought process going on over here, that you don't want to get tied down by what that by the relative truths of your time, rather you want to try and figure out how to live beyond that into eternal truths. How do you do such a thing? How do you find truth? If you're looking at the world around you, so where am I going to find truth? Don't I look at what the world around me says to be true? That's what I would think, right? You would think that you look to the, the, the teachers in your days, you look to see what the world around you believes. But he doesn't actually say that. He gives us a little bit of a hint in the, in the following verse where we're, we're closing on the end of time, but we should be able to at least touch on this 13th verse over here. Sorry. And he's going to tell us very simply four words, how, where, where, where are you going to find real truth? And he says, et look at the, act, at the acts of God. Okay. And in the end of the day, we've, we've, seen a lot of different things from King Solomon. He's talked about God a little bit. He's talked, he's talked about other things a lot. In the end of the day, he's a book of the Tanakh, and he's got one central theme that he wants to make sure you know, which is that if you want to find wisdom, there's only one place you're going to find pure, objective wisdom that does not, that is not tainted or affected by the world around you, and that is Ma'aseha Elokim. Right, a et maaseh Elokim. Look at the acts of God. Kimi yuchal l'takain et asher ivato. It's interesting how they how they how the commentators explain what this second half of the verse means. But let me translate it like this: Because who is able to fix that which he has, which the per, which the person has bent? Okay, even so, we had that earlier. Uvat lo yuchal itkom. We had that in. I think it was the second chapter or third chapter. Uh, so over here, it means evato means something that's bent, so that he or the, the person has bent. So what it says is, Ki who is able to fix eight asher evato, that which they have bent. Okay, so let's see the verse all together one more time. Look at the acts of God. Ki, because when I talk about humans, who can fix that which we, which we as humans, bend? So we look at things and we say, we think we know truth. And we come up with our own ways of thinking. We bend things to fit our narrative. 
And unfortunately, that bends things out of shape, right? Who is able to fix that? Not necessarily anyone. What you're saying is that you can't really fix some, some mistakes. They lead you on a path that you can't necessarily fix. Rather, again, heralding, hearkening back to that earlier part of the verse, re'et ma'aseh halokim. Look at the acts of God. So in that sense, the way I always perceive this personally is we, we look at the world around us and we see struggles. We see questions. We see things that just don't, we don't know what to do with them. Whether it's a political issue that there's two sides and you, you can't really figure out which one's right or wrong. You know, they both have arguments in their favor. Or whether it's just in life, you're dealing with struggles personally. And you don't know where, and, and it, you almost wonder sometimes, I wish the world had a manual, you know, if I have a computer program, it has a manual, and I know how to troubleshoot certain issues. If only the world had such a thing. And that's really what he's saying over here is the world does have such a thing. You're looking at it, right? It, if you want to find the, the if we're looking for that objective, untampered, unadulterated truth, unadulterated wisdom. So where are you going to find that? You're going to find that in the, in the manual. You're going to find that in the acts of God. You're going to find that he doesn't necessarily say the Torah itself. He says the acts of God. So that can that can potentially be found in a number of places, right? Uh, the, Maimonides says uh, himself that one of the ways to access wisdom is by spending some time and looking at the world around you. And that's going to draw you towards some sort of love of God, some sort of introspective in, introspection in the relationship with God himself. Uh, also, the Chavot Halavavot, Duties of the Heart, also says it has a whole whole piece on that, very long piece on that, a similar idea of introspection through looking at the world around us. So it doesn't necessarily, this, these words don't necessarily have to mean look at the Torah itself. I would say you definitely should look at the Torah itself. That is where you find God's wisdom presented on a silver platter. But I, you potentially could find it with, in, in other ways, through nature, through science. through. But you want to look at the acts of God through those objective truths that God puts in this world, you want to find wisdom, that's where you're going to find it. What do we do when we try to make up wisdom? We, get, we end up with something bent, right? We, we end up with something all twisted and turned. And it's very hard to fix that, especially since it ends up building on itself. One generation believes one thing, and the next generation takes a step further, the next generation takes a step further, and next thing you know, you know, you can have something that for 400 years everyone's believed to be true, and it's not necessarily true, right? As I said at the beginning of the class, let's take the, the example of the world. Uh, people thought the, world, the earth was the center of the universe, okay? We know, we know scientifically that that is not true now. So at some point, a mistake was made, and it consistently grew and grew and grew until everyone believed it. Uh, so that, again, is what he seems to be indicating with who is able to fix that which is bent. I, it's worthwhile. I'm just going to skip I, I'm not going to do this verse now. I just want you to see, because of my argument is that this is all leading to the, this, the rest of the chapter is really all this idea to, in some form or another. And if you just see the last line of the chapter, um, he says like this, this highlighted point. He says, Asher Elokim et Adam Yashar. God makes mankind straight, meaning with right think forward thinking straightforward thinking but it's humankind that comes up with all sort of convoluted ideas so that's the same idea but we'll see it all play out to get to this point uh but it, it's all it's all the same idea sorry let's come back to where we are um uh, which is that we if we want to find truth again objective truth that's not tainted not adulterated or anything like that, you're only, really only, only going to find it in one place, the acts of God. Again, either Torah or potentially it could also mean nature through introspection of a, of a different way uh, of, uh, of, of looking at the world around us and finding those objective things, those things that cannot be tampered with by humankind. They just are the Maaseh Elohim, the acts of God. Okay, so that is uh, this week's verses. Again, that's uh, 11, 12, and 13, uh, we did this week, also touching back on number 10 from last week. Uh, and again, it's building on this idea of 
looking, trying to find wisdom, not just in your own days, not just in the past, trying to create some sort of synthesis of looking to the past for guidance, but also be forward thinking. Okay, so that brings us now back to our our, our main room. Uh, thank you for joining us. Next week is Rosh Hashanah. So